using 1 John 1, 9, if necessary, to confess our sins to God the Father, to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, which is synonymous with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and abiding in Christ and walking in Christ. Again, a lot of the similar Greek words there. So again, we uh, utilize this time, if necessary, to adjust to the justice of God by changing our heart and walking away from sin and now entering into the righteousness of God by having God cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <clears throat> and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to come forward to study your word and now to worship you through the study of your word and through our song. We thank you for this day to glorify you and to walk in your will and plan. We thank you, Father, for all the logistical grace blessings that you have provided for us and our families. And we ask that you continue to provide for our every need so that we can continue to do your will going forward in your plan. We also pray, Father, for our church that you continue to watch over it, protect and guide it, that you lead us in all of our work and service towards you and lead us to glorify you both locally, nationally, and throughout the world as we spread the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, and also the truth of your word to a lost and dying generation. And Father, we ask that you continue to watch over our nation, that you continue to provide the freedoms that we so richly enjoy. We thank you for all the prosperities and the freedoms that we do have, Father. We know that you are the provider of those things, and we ask that you continue to provide them according to your will. We pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world, who also helps provide for our freedom. We ask that you protect all of those who are serving, keep them from harm's way as much as possible. And for those who have been wounded, Father, we ask that you bring healing to their bodies and to their souls. And also for those who have given the greatest sacrifice, Father, given their lives, we thank you for their service and for their sacrifice. And we especially pray for their loved ones who are now left alone and have lost their loved ones in battle. We ask that you strengthen and comfort them by your word and by your spirit. And Father, we also pray this evening for the Mossy family in this local area that you be with them in the loss of their son or brother and uh, friend. And we ask that you give comfort and healing to them also by your word and by your spirit. So Father, we thank you again for this time that we have together to worship you and to glorify you. And we ask that you help us lift up our hearts in song and in praise and also in concentration of your word. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, if we could all rise for our doxology. And bless the Lord, O my soul, is our song of choice. All right, so please follow after me. A little faster now, right? Okay. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. O my soul, I worship your holy name. One more time. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I worship your holy name. Amen, and please be seated. That was very good. We're getting it. We're getting it. <laughs> All right, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. <clears throat> and as you know, we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart and not lean upon our own understanding, as Proverbs 3 5 commands. And that's why we take in the Word of God on a consistent basis so that we have doctrine resonant within our souls so that we can apply it to our every aspect of our everyday lives. So tonight we continue on in that third section that we started on Sunday in Proverbs chapter 14 in verses 16 through 32 specifically. And as you know, the second section, verses 8 through 15, was all about walking by faith and not by sight. And so now in these verses, we're going to know walking by faith in the sight of others. So in other words, demonstrating that unique spiritual life of being a Christian, operating according to God's will and plan and his word, having divine viewpoint and ethics and morality within our soul based on the holiness and righteousness of God and his word that is now given to us that teaches us these things that we should have resident within our soul, coupled with the filling and the empowering enabling ministry of God the Holy Spirit, we can walk experientially sanctified each and every 
every day, doing the will of God, walking in his plan, going forward according to his will. And so tonight we continue on the, uh, this uh, subunit that we know. Remember, there are three subunits that we have in section three. And the subunit that we're noting here is the first one, which is contrast in character and ethical behavior. So that's what we're noting in verses 16 through 18. So let's read those uh, before we get into some more detail. Where in verse 16a, it says, A wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. The naive inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. So what we noted on Sunday when we introduced this subject in these verses were, were the first part, which is 16a and then 18b, that talked about the wise and prudent man and how he functions and operates. Again, he is cautious in all he does, and he turns away from evil. He avoids it like the plague, as I noted to you on Sunday. And as a result of that, there is a blessing where in verse 18b it says, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. In other words, you have more Bible doctrine, you are protecting your soul, you're keeping the evil out of your soul, and you're keeping Bible doctrine and the Word of God in your soul. You are staying filled with the Holy Spirit, and you are, are saying no to the sin nature control of your soul, and therefore you continue to protect your soul on a consistent basis as a result, walking in fellowship, walking in the Spirit, doing the will and plan of God for your life. So we noted what the wise individual does and the benefits that he receives. Tonight we're going to talk about the things that the wise man avoids. And so he is cautious to avoid evil. And then we are given a list of various types of evils that he is to avoid. So that's what we're going to note tonight. And ultimately, there are four descriptions of, first and foremost, the reversionistic or cosmic believer who is operating inside of Satan's cosmic system, totally controlled by their sin nature, whether it be a reversionistic believer or the unbeliever. This is how how they can function and operate, and these are the types of individuals that we're to avoid. So we have four descriptions of the type of reversionistic believer, and then we see four characteristics or consequences, we could even say, of that type of individual. And if we associate with them, we'll have those same consequences within our lives. So let's start off there where we talk about the four, and the four ultimate characteristics that we note is first and foremost that they are a fool. We'll talk about what type of fool, because there's different Hebrew words for fool, as we've noted. So we'll see what type of fool is in view there. Then we're also told to avoid the quick-tempered individual. Then we are told to avoid a man of evil devices. And then finally, to avoid the naive type of individual. The naive who, again, is a simpleton, is, uh, does not have doctrine in their soul, and is totally uh, following after Satan's cosmic system. So we'll talk about all four of these individuals as we look at what the Hebrew tells us about these individuals going forward. So first and foremost, we have the fool. That is the typical Greek word. The majority of the time the word fool is translated uh, in the English. It comes from the Hebrew, kasil, K-E-S-I-Y-L. We've seen that a number of different times already, so I'm not spending a lot of time there. But that kasil type of individual, or that kasil type of fool, is one who willfully and obstinately is walking in a wrong direction. Again, they're choosing to do this. They know what's right, but they're saying, I don't care what's right. I'm going to do it my way anyway. I know I've been told to do it this way by the word of God, but you know what? I'm going to join in the party over here and do what everybody else is doing or doing what I want to do or satisfy the lust patterns of my soul. And I'm going to do the things that I want to do. And so that's what this type of person is. Again, they are characterized as stupid, foolish. Uh, when we translate, like that from the Hebrew into the English. They are sluggards. They are dull. Again, uh, their lazy individuals are in view there. They know they should be working, but instead they just sit on the couch and click the clicker all day long and collect their paychecks from the welfare or whatever the case may be or live off of other people. So again, they are obstinate, willful in what they do. They know there's a better way. They know they should be doing something different, but they don't want to do it for whatever reason. Typically that reason is sin nature 
into control of their soul, and they're, uh, again, uh, they're satisfying the lust patterns of their soul. So we've talked about the doctrine of fool. We did that uh, several months back uh, in our study of the book of Proverbs thus far. You can get more detail on this type of individual, but I think we all understand this type of individual pretty clearly by now. Then we also have another familiar term that we've seen uh, sporadically throughout the book of Proverbs thus far, and that's what we call the quick-tempered individual. Now, it's interesting, and I love the play on words here, and really we're talking about an idiom that is used in the Hebrew that ha actually has meaning to us, you know, had meaning to the Hebrews, and then also has meaning to us in the English as well. But the first word that we have is katsar, and katsar ultimately means short, and then you have with that, or joined with that, the word off. And off is the word for nose, or sometimes it can be used for the entire face. But typically it means nose. So what the Hebrew literally says here is this is a short-nosed individual, okay? Now it's very funny how they use that. And then later on we're going to see a comparison against a long-nosed individual. But here we have a short-nosed individual, which literally is a Greek idiom, talking about somebody as we would call it today in our idiom, a short fuse, okay? You know, that's a term that we're very familiar with in the English language and in our day and age. You know, we say that person has a short fuse. And again, that's, you, know, you know what a fuse is. You light it and then it burns down, burns down, then the explosion goes off, the firecracker or the bomb or whatever the case. And the shorter the fuse, the less time you have to react to the bombing. But if there's a long fuse, there's a little bit more time to respond or to react to what's going on and the danger that may be coming. But here, this individual is a short-nosed individual or a short-fused individual, as it says here, a quick-tempered person. This is the person that gets angry at the drop of a hat. You know, you rub them the wrong way or, you know, uh, you know sometimes you don't even know what you said and they flip out on you. They get angry. They start yelling and screaming. It's like, what did I do? You know, what did I say? But but there was something that just that just you know tripped their switch and they went off like a bomb that's the type of individual if somebody consistently functions and operates in that way the word of god says avoid that person like the plague avoid them like the plague because you don't want to be around the bomb when it goes off. It could have detrimental effects to you physically or even mentally. And you don't want to be around that. God doesn't want you to be around that. So if there's somebody in your periphery that operates like that on a consistent basis, avoid them like the plague. And if it's a friend, I would disassociate with that friend very quickly. And if it's somebody, you know, a boss on the job or somebody on the job, again, sometimes you have to suck it up and go with it, especially if it's a boss. But again, not, no harm in looking for another job and trying to get a better boss or trying to get a better job where you don't have to be under that type of abuse and abusive uh, nature all the time. So again, avoid them like the plague. Get out of there. Get away from that individual because these people just flip out at a moment's notice and they get very angry, uh, you know, at the slightest little things. And they get, uh, you know, angered, you know, at, at, uh, when they're provocated to get angry. And what's interesting is sometimes the provocation's real. So many times somebody will insult them, and they have every right in the world, we would say, to get angry. But yet, even though you have every right in the world to get angry, you know, you got to think about it first and not be a quick-tempered individual. You know, think about the process. Have divine viewpoint. Have impersonal, unconditional love. And don't react right away. But even though there may be real provocations, again, we are to be chased within our heart and think about it first. But many times with these individuals, it's an imaginary provocation. And again, they're just making things up in their mind and they think that somebody insulted them or they think somebody offended them and therefore they flip out and they snap uh, like a twig. So again, this is an individual that easily becomes angered, quick-tempered. And we have that comparison in verse 29 uh, to another individual that we see should, uh, you know, in comparison to being patient. And when we look at it in verse 29, we actually have some uh, different uh, Hebrew words there. But let's look at verse 29. It says, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. Now, the interesting thing is, is in the second half, he who is quick-tempered exalts folly is different in the Hebrew. Okay, it uses the word katsa for short, but it doesn't use af for face. It use, uses ruach, which is the word for spirit. So in verse 29, when it says quick tempered, it's talking about short of spirit. 
but it has similar connotations. But the shorter spirit even has a greater understanding because that's a very impatient type of individual. And impatience is what's more in view in verse 29 than just getting angry. And you all know the impatient person. Again, I'm one of them, okay? And I shouldn't be. i got to calm down from time. I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. Get me this. Get me that. No, I don't do that all the time. Although, don't talk to my wife, okay? She'll probably tell you all about it. All right. But again, the impatient person, you know, they can't wait two seconds for, you know, everybody else to gather and then let's go. They can't wait two seconds for the waiter to serve them the meal at the restaurant. They can't wait two seconds for somebody to, you know, do the job that they have asked them to do. And they get very short fused in that sense and they're very impatient. And that then leads to uh, further anger. Now, what's interesting in verse 29, it says he who is slow to anger. And that phrase, slow to anger, it uses the opposite of uh, what we have, katsah, and it uses the Hebrew word, arak, which is the word for long. And then it says there in the first half, it says they're long off or long nosed. And that's the person who's slow to anger. You see, the person that's short, uh, that, that's uh, uh, quick to anger or quick tempered is the katsah off. But then the person that is long before they get angry is that, again, arak off. Again, the long nosed individual. So, again, you see the comparison between the short fuse and the long fuse, as we would use it in our English idioms. In the Hebrew, it was the short nose and the long nose. The short nosed person, they flip out at a moment's notice. The long nosed individual had a little bit more patience. They had a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, resistance to just flip out at a moment's notice. They had a more of a relaxed mental attitude in regards to life. So what we see with the quick-tempered person, as I said, they don't have a relaxed mental attitude. They aren't mastering the details of life. They aren't demonstrating impersonal and unconditional love, and they are very impatient. <clears throat> And again, as the Word of God says, somebody who is habitually like that, again, avoid them like the plague. Because what happens is it's infectious. You know, you know these things. You know that sin is very infectious. And if people are sinning around you, it's very easy for you to just fall into that sin. And you're around it so much and you're tempted and you're tempted and you're tempted. And eventually you give over to it because you've resisted, 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 but then you give in for whatever reason. And so ultimately, again, this infection with the quick temper type of individual, you see somebody who flips out at a moment's notice and you are around them all the time and that's how they always operate. Before you know it, you're doing the same thing to other people. And so again, we have to learn from the Word of God. We have to learn what not to do in the spiritual life. And that's what uh, I find fascinating, especially about the book of Proverbs. It does tell us about what to do, but the majority of what we see is what not to do. You see, Proverbs is saying, don't do this, don't do that. What not to do? How not to live? So in order to live the spiritual life, in order to live a life under Christ and to our fellow mankind, we have to not do certain things and instead do the opposite of them. Not be a short-nosed person and instead be a long-nosed individual and again have that impersonal and unconditional love. So a long-nosed or long-fused person is one who is described as being calm, they are patient. They have relaxed mental attitude. They are calm within their soul and within their spirit. They are also prudent. You see, because they hear and they listen before they react. And they not just hear and listen and then react, but they cycle the information through. They think about all the, the, the consequences. They think about, I could do this or I could do that. And you all know, you know, the sin nature loves to get that first reaction out of us. When somebody does something to us and again, they want to, uh, you know, push our buttons or if they offend us somehow or some way, they do something we don't like, what happens? Again, our sin nature wants us to react right away. And that's what we call biting our tongue. We have to bite our tongue. And just say, no, I'm not going to function in this way. I'm not going to react. I'm not going to let my sin nature just blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. Let me think about this first. Let me have that relaxed mental attitude. Let me be prudent and let me think through the consequences of the action I'm about to take. And if you think through the, uh, the consequences and the right reaction is to have righteous anger, then go ahead and have righteous anger. Nothing wrong with that. But you're not doing it in a short fuse or with a short nose. 
You're doing it after contemplation and wisdom being, uh, 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 being cycled through your soul and then applied. And then righteous anger can come out. So again, if somebody is quick-tempered, short-fused, short-nosed, as we say, again, avoid them like the plague. Instead, we are to be long-suffering, as our Lord is long-suffering, as we see over and over and over again throughout the New Testament. And again, if you just want to just think about that a little bit, and I'm sure you have in the past, but just think about how long-suffering and patient God is with you. And then say, okay, if he does that with me, I guess I better do it with other people, okay? And that's what we should do. I mean, I think about how long-suffering he is with this world. I mean, how much more needs to be proved how evil, evil is? <laughs> How much more does it need to be proved? How much more do we have to, you know, uh, present the, uh, the, the trial, the repeal, and the uh, abuttal of phases of the angelic conflict and the appeal trial of Satan? How much longer do we have to prove that out? Well, we know at least 1,007 years, right? Because we know there's a tribulation. We know there's a millennium. But how much longer? Again, God has his plan. God has his timing. And God is long-suffering. And God allows, again, this time frame because of his righteousness and justice to allow Satan to play it out to the full degree that he possibly can. And ultimately, you know, we'll end it one day. And already you could say there's, you know, no shadow of a doubt of the guilt of Satan and the fallen angels. But at the time when it, all, it is all said and done, there absolutely will be no doubt of the guilt of Satan and all the fallen angels. So God is long-suffering with you, with the world, with the unbeliever, with people. Again, we too should be long-suffering with our fellow man, especially inside the church, our husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends and uh, people that we associate inside our fellowship. Again, we should be long-suffering and not just you know, flip out at a moment's notice. Peace, uh, peace in the mentality of our soul, inner peace and contentment as we talk about time and time again. So here we also understand number three is a man of evil devices. This is another type of person we are to avoid like the plague. And the man of evil de devices, the man is the word ish, we've seen that. And evil devices is uh, mezima, we've seen that a number of times too. And it means somebody who thinks, has a plan, has a, you know, a, a thought process, and ultimately, devices, where it talks about evil thoughts or evil plans. We call this the schemer. Somebody who's always trying to scheme, you know, something. He's trying to stir up trouble or he's trying to get something from someone else or, and, and he doesn't care who he hurts in the process. The schemer. They're always trying to figure out how I can get ahead and I don't care what happens to anybody else. That's the man of evil devices that we're warned to stay away from. They cause problems in uh, your life. They cause problems in the lives of others, whether it be in the family, the neighborhood, again, the community, whatever the case. Again, they're always scheming, trying to, you know, uh, you know uh, you take the rug out from underneath you, steal from you, uh, take from you, whatever the case. And they don't care. This individual does not care the hurt that they bring on other people. So if you know somebody that's a schemer and is always trying to, you know, uh, think up trouble in regard to other people or hurt other people in somehow in some way, again, stay away from that individual. And then number four is the naive one, which we've seen a number of times. Pethi is the Hebrew word here. It's a plural here. So it's the naive, again, talking about the whole category of naive people. Pethiaim is the uh, Hebrew here. But the, na the naive as we've defined it, the simple ones, the ones that are inexperienced, the ones that, you know, think they know it all, but actually they don't have all the information. Again, like the teenager who thinks they know it all and they're ready to go out in the world, but yet they know nothing of the world whatsoever. And they think they're smarter than their parents, so they don't listen to what their parents have to say and they just, well, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And what happens with these people, because they don't have knowledge and they don't have experience, they are easily seduced and they are easily deceived. Again, seduced by what? The common viewpoint. Seduced by what? False doctrines when they come out. Again, easily given over to what somebody else thinks about this when yet the Word of God is clear as to what it says. 
Again, because they haven't spent the time in the Word of God, they can easily be, be swayed over to somebody else's thoughts and opinions in regard to how to live life or what the world is all about or even what Christianity is all about. And so this is the immature believer that follows, as we've noted already previously in Ephesians 4.14, every wind of doctrine. Every wind of doctrine. And again, I've told you time and time again, don't just believe what I say. Go to the Word of God and see what the Word of God has to say. And make sure that what I'm saying is backed up by the Word of God. And don't just go along with what the pastor says because he's the authority. Because I'll get you in a lot of trouble because there's a lot of people in it with authority and have set themselves up as authorities, but yet they espouse false doctrines from the, behind the pulpit time and time again. It's like the Catholic Church. You know, don't read your Bibles. They used to tell the people, and they probably still do. Don't read your Bible. I'll tell you what's in it, and then, you know, I'll tell you, you know, what you need to know. You just need to listen to me. I think we, when we were kids and my parents went to the Episcopalian Church, wanted to have a Bible study. Oh, you don't need a Bible study. I'll just tell you what you need to know. You don't need to read your Bible. And again, many churches, even non-denominational non churches like ours, set up the pastor in this ultimate position of authority. Just listen to him, and you don't need to read your Bible. And many people get uh, deceived and seduced by following the false doctrines and whatever those individuals have to say. But ultimately, it causes division. And again, if you see a doctrine coming out in a new doctrine and it causes division amongst uh, brethren that were uh, united previously, you know it's of the devil. It's plain and simple. It's very easy. You know it's of the devil. And so the naive person just goes along with the flow, whatever anybody says, and because they don't have the knowledge and wisdom. And so these are the people that we are to avoid, the ones that are willfully and obstinately living counter to God's will, word, and plan for their life. And again, we all have, you know, you know, we're talking about the egregious person, but, you know, we could all have correction within our lives because we all live from time to time. I know what I should do, but I'm not going to do it for whatever reason. I'd rather do this thing. I know what I should do. I know I should go here. I know I should read that. I know I should do this, but I'm not going to, and I'm going to do something else. Again, we all have a little bit of that in our souls from time to time. So let's correct that and clean that up and do our best to walk in the will of the Father each and every day. As Jesus said in the Garment of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. And that should be our attitude. But we know there are uh, people, foolish people, out in the world who are willful and obstinate in their way of thinking. Avoid them because it will rub off on you if you have a close association with them. And as I said before, if you haven't uh, studied the doctrine of separation that I taught several years ago, it's out on uh, the internet as well, please get that doctrine because you need to know how to separate mentally and be in association with someone. Because sometimes, you know, you're in a relationship, husband and wife, you know, this isn't grounds for divorce, sorry, can't do it, okay? And you might think, oh, I'm going to leave him for this, or I'm going to leave her for that. And again, you know, the Word of God says, I want you to stay together. And there's a way to mentally separate. And again, if you are abused mentally and physically on a consistent basis, by all means, the Word of God says separate. But there's a way to mentally separate where you could be in association or, or, or a relationship with someone and not allow their mentality to affect yours. But it's hard. It's difficult. And you have to double down on Bible doctrine in order to do that. And then from there, if you can't mentally separate, then the second part is physically separate because it's the best thing for you. Physically separate and get out of that relationship. And for people who are in churches that are teaching false doctrine, and I'm sure a lot of you have come from denominations or other uh, churches that were uh, steeped in false doctrine, what'd you do? You separated. Oh, the majority of people stayed behind, didn't they? Most of your family and friends stayed there, right? They did. And it was difficult to separate, right? But it was the best thing for you to get out of that because it's not helping you and it's just detrimental to your walk. And in order for you to go forward in the plan of God, you need to separate yourself from the herd, as it were, and then walk with your relationship personally with Jesus Christ each and every day. You've got to separate to do that. 
Then number two, the hot-headed and reckless type of individual uh, in their actions. Again, reckless, I didn't really talk too much about that, but the quick-tempered uh, person is reckless because they're reacting so quickly. They don't know what kind of uh, uh, chaos they're creating. And they don't really care either, as we're going to see in just a minute. So the hot-headed and reckless individual in their actions. Then number three, the schemer looking to harm other people. That's typically what the schemer's trying to do. First and foremost, they're trying to, you know, better themselves and get something for themselves. But the point is, is they, they're trying to get it from somebody else. And they don't care who they hurt. And they're just trying to scheme how I can do this and how I can do that. And it's funny in a sad commentary that on our, you know, our, our welfare systems today, many people scheme as to how I can get as much as I possibly can from the government. And I don't have to work. Because it's easier. I can sit, stay at home and just collect checks all day. And again, they are scheming. How can I leverage this? And ultimately, they're hurting the people, the overall nation, because they're just taking, 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 and they're not giving anything back. So again, the schemers looking to harm others. Or number four, those seduced by sinful in common worldly thinking of the day. That's the naive individual who is uh, just thinking about what does you know, what, what uh, the news have to say? What does the magazine have to say? What, is, you know, what does everybody else have to say? And that's where I'm going to go. Again, seduced by sinful and common worldly thinking of the day. These are the type of individuals that we are to avoid because as a result of that type of mentality in their soul, there are four consequences that we also see. And if we associate with these individuals closely, it's going to rub off on us. So again, if we either have to uh, separate mentally or we have to do it physically, whichever leads us to continuing to walk with our, uh, in fellowship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we see four categories here. The arrogant and careless. And it's funny, these sound like uh, characteristics, but they're giving to us as consequences. They're arrogant and careless. And then number two, they are foolish in what they do. They are hated by others, as we're going to note, and they will inherit foolishness. And the fool will just inherit more foolishness. We'll talk about what each of these means as we go forward. So first and foremost is arrogant and careless. Again, this word for arrogant is interesting. It's the hithpael uh, of Ava, and it's, the hithpael is a reflective voice. It means they do this to themselves. They perform an action, but the action comes right back around to them. And remember that this is with what? The fool. The fool, in verse 16b, is arrogant and careless. And in their arrogance here, it's kind of interesting. That, you know, both of these words have kind of a similar meaning, but the word for arrogant here means to pass on through or to pass over. In other words, they're just passing over. It's like they, they could care less is what's in view here. But the word arrogant is what comes out. And when it's in the Hithpael, the, um, uh, what is called the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, notes that there are eight occurrences of this word in the Hithpael, the reflective voice, in the Hebrew. And the meaning then comes to be to show oneself as angry, get excited, or flared up. So it's kind of like that hot-tempered person, right? Even though it's the arrogant individual. So we see, again, how arrogance leads to the quick-tempered individual and how one builds upon the other. And the quick-tempered individual is also what? Very arrogant within their soul. But this word also, in its base form, has that sense of passing through or passing over and just going about life and not having a care in life, but again, uh, placed in uh, wrong things and having wrong motivation. Because then we also have the word careless. And this is the word batak. We've seen this before. And it does mean careless. It means to trust or place confidence in something. And what's interesting here is that it says, but a fool is arrogant and careless. And many times batak is used in a good way. You're placing your trust and confidence in the Lord or the word of God. And sometimes it's a good thing to have spiritual self-esteem and that, that, that spiritual self-confidence because of the word in your soul. 
But here it's talking about self-confidence or being confident, but you're confident in not God or trusting in the Lord or his word. They're confident in themselves. So again, we see arrogance coming forward. They place confidence in themselves and they're unconcerned about the effect that they have on other people whether they harm them or not, as long as they're getting what they want, as long as they're getting out of life what they think they deserve. And so when we say careless, we could also separate those two words because they care less about anybody else. They're careless in their actions, which means they just do what they want to do and they don't care what they, who they hurt. But we also say they don't give a dang about anybody else. Okay? And they are care less in their actions. They don't care about anybody or anything else as long as they get what they want, when they want, and how they want. So ultimately, they could care less about what they do to or what happens to others. And when we looked at that word for schemer again, the evil divisor, again, we see overlap in all of these things. And it all starts with the fool who is arrogant and careless. And they don't care what they do or how it comes about. And ultimately, this word also gives us a connotation they have a false sense of security. Because the arrogance and the puffed up nature of their soul, they just do what they want to do and they think they're fine, they're okay. And they don't care about the consequences that come as a result. And especially the consequences that the Word of God tells us what will happen to these individuals. That God will ultimately you know, if it's a believer, discipline them. And for the unbeliever, there's going to be a day of judgment for them too. But this person has a false sense of security. They think they can do whatever they want to do, regardless of who it hurts. And they're going to be okay. And you see a lot of individuals operating like that uh, in our generation as well. Lovers of self, as we've read in the list of sins uh, in, in the New Testament time and time again. Lovers of self, arrogant. They could care less about anybody or anything. Again, and that becomes a consequence to them. It's an action item, but it's also a consequence. It's very interesting. The fool becomes arrogant and the fool becomes careless. In other words, they are just in a downward spiral of reversionism and evil. And it just is going to get worse and worse and worse for them as long as they stay in that mode of operation. And they never get to a point of rebounding and recovering. So this individual, also, or, or the other type of individual that we are to avoid, in verse 17, a, a, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. And again, acting foolishly, we have the word asa, which is the word to make or do. It's in the cal and perfect, so it means they do it over and over and over again. They continually act in this way. And this word is elwith for foolishly. And ultimately, uh, uh, what this word for foolish in the Hebrew means is being imprudent. Again, they're not prudent. They're not, they don't have forethought. They're not thinking things through. They're not having divine uh, view and perspective. They're not applying the wisdom of the word of God. They are not being prudent. And it also carries a sense of having moral degeneracy. In other words, legalism. You know, moral degeneracy. Oh, they think if they do the do's and don'ts and do the stations of the cross and the Hail Marys and uh, whatever else. Again, they get in a downward slope of moral degeneracy. And it's funny, you know, this controversy in regard to, uh, it's not a controversy, it's just uh, some people, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, peeled off in the true doctrine, saying you don't need to confess your sins anymore. Well, you know what, for some of them, that became legalistic. And that's why they don't understand the true application of, by, uh, uh, of the Word of God when it says to confess our sins in 1 John 1, 9, because it became legalistic to them. They entered into moral degeneracy, and they didn't understand the true sense of the nature and the context of the Scriptures and the process of confessing your sins unto the Lord. Again, that downward slope of moral degeneracy. And it becomes a moralistic ritual for you. And again, I hope that's none of you where you use the confession of sins as just a routine. Because it's not. It's like communion. It's not just a routine. 
It's a ritual, but we have reality. The confession of sins is what God has told us to do, but it has meaning and reality behind it. And it's part of appropriating the grace of God. Because God does all the work for our cleansing. We can't cleanse ourselves. He does all the work. And we name it to God, and we have the cleansing of our vessel. So again, the person who acts foolishly, they, can get, they, get, they make decisions that aren't good for them, have consequences towards them. And then also with the results of moral degeneracy, whether it gets into various types of legalism or whatever the case may be. And it's funny that the people that, you know, going back to the confession of sins, the f- people that are talking about you don't have to confess your sins anymore because it, it's a legalistic act, okay? They were already down a slope of moral degeneracy because they viewed it as a legalistic act. They didn't understand the right doctrine, and now they throw it out completely, and now they're into human works. Oh, it's up to me to change my mind. And when I change my mind, I get the, I, I'm immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. Sorry, but the Word of God says different from that. Fellowship filling, it's all based on the confession of your sins. So in any case, you go from one to the other. Now, the other thing about these individuals is they love asceticism and they have a lust for approbation. And asceticism, remember I showed you the chart on the sin nature and the lust patterns of the soul? And asceticism means the moral degeneracy. They love to just be told what to do and what not to do. And they don't want to have to think about it. Let me just do the stations of the cross. Let me rub the rosary beads. Let me say so many prayers. And oh, I'm okay. And they just do it without any thought behind it whatsoever. And they love that. But asceticism carries on a a, a greater aspect to it, which also means they have a lust for approbation. They want the pat on the back. They want to be told how good they are. They want to be shown as how righteous they are, and how holy they are, and how much better they are than everybody else. And again, you see how these, you know, going back to the sin nature and uh, uh, not having to confess your sins anymore, you can see how that can flourish. Now we're better than the rest because they were bad, now we're good. Again, they want the approbation, they want the lust, they want the power, they want the authority. It's amazing how this works, and we're seeing it as we, uh, you know, as we teach these things and read these things, you know, be revealed right before our eyes. It's amazing. We have great examples, you know, right before us, which is unfortunate. But again, avoid these things, and this is a result This is a consequence. You see, the acting foolishly is a consequence of continued or or prior uh, steps of not being filled with the Spirit and not applying the Word of God and instead getting caught up in ritual and moralistic and other types of a wrong mentality. Getting caught up in Satan's cosmic system. And if you continue to march in that way, again, these are the consequences where you have the results, where now the things that you're doing, you may think it's good. Again, as it says in, uh, you know, there is, in verse 12, there is a way which seems right to the man, but in its way is, or it, uh, but at the end of its way is what? Death. Seems right to, to the man. But yet that man is now so steeped in falseness and uh, in cosmic living. Again, they are acting foolishly as we have before us. And again, that is a consequence. And if you associate with those types of people, guess what? You're going to act foolishly too. So then we see the third one. And this then goes and tells us that the man of evil devices is hated. And this may not seem like, uh, you know, like this happens all the time. And again, when you look at these people who are acting inside of Satan's cosmic system, it seems like the world loves them, doesn't it? it? seems like they get everything. seems like they're getting all the praise. seems like they're getting all the money. They're getting all the riches. seems like they're getting puffed up, right? Well, that would be the case when you have a degenerate society around them. But if you had a, a righteous society around them, they wouldn't be puffed up. And they would be hated by the rest of the society, especially the schemer. Again, this schemer, who is a cold blooded schemer. And again, remember, we talked about the schemer. You know, they think things through, they plot, they plan, which used rightly is a good thing. But this individual uses it in all the wrong way, and they plot, they plan, they think. 
but in their plotting and planning, they are cold-blooded because they're just looking out for themselves, and they don't care about the people that are around them. So the consequences of the cold-blooded schemer, he incurs what? The enmity of others. And again, the enmity certainly of God and the enmity of those who are walking in righteousness. And typically in society, the schemer is, uh, is one day shown for the true colors that he is. And then as a result, people dislike that individual and are at enmity with that individual, want to throw them off, want to get rid of that, that person. And so that's this phrase, is hated. Sane is the Hebrew word, S-A-N-E. Again, in the passive voice, they receive this action. They receive being hated. It's a consequence of being an evil schemer. And in this case, the cold-blooded calculator who's trying to hurt other people or get, gain things from other people to benefit themselves. And then we wrap it up in uh, uh, point number four, where we go down into verse 18, where it says, the naive inherit folly. Plain and simple, the naive, again, the simple one, the I go with every wind of doctrine one, what are they going to inherit? Foolishness. They're going to inherit more folly. So the naive inherit folly. And that word for inherit, nakal, is the Hebrew word to take possession of or to inherit. It means what you're going to receive, what's going to be left behind for you. And what's going to be left behind for these people? Just more folly and more foolishness. And what does that mean? Well, ultimately, it's, it tells us that all they will have to show for their actions here on earth is the foolishness that they were involved in and nothing more. You see, when we operate in the righteousness of God, we are building our soul. We're edifying our soul. And as a result, God blesses us and will reward us in time and eternity, especially eternity. And you see, when we get to the eternal state, we'll have something to show. And we're going to have riches and blessings and honor and glorification and, and rule and authority that we're going to be able to show for all of eternity. But this foolish type of individual who's uh, quick-tempered, a deceiver, a schemer, and naive, all they're going to have to show is what they did on earth. And what they did on earth is going to be what? Burnt up in the eternal state. Wood, hay, and straw, as 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 tells us. Wood, hay, and straw. They're going to have nothing to show. And these people, they might have built an empire here on planet earth, but you know what? At the end is... My wife and I always like to say, burnt. Because remember, after the millennial reign, what's going to happen? He's going to destroy the heavens and the earth. Planet earth and the heaven, this universe that we know today is going to be alt literally destroyed, burnt up. And there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So any empire we build here on earth, guess what? Burnt. <laughs> nothing left to it. And this individual will have nothing to show. So ultimately, as, as the Word of God also tells us, because what they have built up in this world and the cosmic empire that they have built here on planet Earth, again, it's what? The Word of God says they've been repaid in full. They've been repaid in full. Let me give you two scriptures as we close that prove that point. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, Jesus says, So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets. Well, look at me, I'm giving to the poor. Look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. You know, blow the trumpet so everybody knows and sees and watch me put it into the offering plate. Watch me put it or give it to this poor individual. Again, that's what we call approbation lust. They lust for people to say, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so good, you're, 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 you're the best person ever. They lust for that, and so they do things. They do human good works so that people will praise them. And as Jesus went on to say, so that they may be honored by men, and he says, truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. And what's their reward? That you got praised, and it's full. You see, there's no a good of intrinsic value, as we call it, or the result of divine good production, which means blessings in time and then in eternity as well. Lasting value. Again, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And then here he's talking about giving to the poor in verse 5. Then he talks about prayer. 
And he's again talking to the hypocrites and the Pharisees and the legalistic individuals of his day and age. He says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Oh, he's so holy and pious. Oh, he's so wonderful. Oh, he's so good. Look at him. Oh, he must be a saintly man. Look at him pray. That's what they want to hear. And that's why they do it. That's their motivation. Approbation less so that other people say, you're a good person. He says, truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Again, they have their reward in full. The praise is all they're going to get. And again, you could live life, and if that's all you want, then go for it. You'll get it. But again, if you want more in this life and in the life to come, continue to glorify God and do it in total humility. Do it in secrecy. Do it in privacy. Again, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing when you're giving your tithes or your offerings, as the word says, or giving to the poor. When you pray, what does it say? Go into your closet, your inner room. Really, it should be your bedroom if we translate it appropriately. Go into your bedroom and shut the door so that nobody knows what you're doing because your Father in heaven hears. And that's all that really matters. So again, do it in humility. And if you are associated with people that operate in this way, then again, we have to avoid those people. Again, separate mentally or separate physically if necessary. Because they will rub off on us and we then will pick up their traits, we'll pick up their characteristics. And unfortunately, we'll pick up their consequences as well. So again, we're warned here to be the wise individual. As it says in verse 16, a wise man is cautious and turns away from evil. He avoids it like the plague. And as a result, he is blessed with what? Having even more knowledge, even more wisdom. And with knowledge and wisdom, that means more execution of the spiritual life. With more execution of the spiritual life, it means more blessings and rewards for time and then also in eternity. And so as I have on the board, Matthew 6 I think I got a typo there. Matthew 6, 16, and then also Luke chapter 6, verse 24. They also reiterate these same types of principles, again, warning us not to associate with those types of individuals and then also telling us to avoid them like the plague. So in conclusion, I wrote a conclusion, so let me read that to you. So the wise and prudent, again, the spiritually mature believer, will avoid entering into the sinful and harmful behaviors of the reversionistic believer and thereby avoid their pitfalls. Not only does he avoid these behaviors in himself, but he avoids close association with those who function in those ways. By avoiding these things and people, he protects his soul from their harmful effects and at the same time allows Bible doctrine to continue to flourish and grow within his soul. So therefore, by avoiding such evils, he will gain knowledge, be in Bible doctrine, and be better equipped to fight the future battles of temptation while continuing to serve the Lord and others to the maximum. And that is the benefit that we have by avoiding the folly and foolishness of this world. All right, so uh, we'll close there in prayer. And we'll come back and pick it up with uh, verse 19 uh, through uh, 20, I think I'm going to go through 24 on Thursday. So let's just close in prayer. And Father, we thank you for this time and for this word. Thank you for giving us these uh, warning signs and signals and helping us to avoid these things, Father. And we just ask that you, through your spirit, help us to apply this word each and every day so that we do avoid these types of things and instead walk in fellowship with you, walk in righteousness applying impersonal and unconditional love to our fellow mankind and also developing our relationship with you more and more each and every day. So, Father, we ask that you be with us on our way home, that you give us travel blessings according to your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And with that, you are dismissed.